Okay, yeah, so good morning, folks. Um, as you've already heard, my name's Pete Edwards. Um, I'm from the University of Durham, and I'm a cosmologist. What's a cosmologist? Well, cosmology is an ology. It's the study of something. And cosmology is the ology of the cosmos. The cosmos is an old word for the universe. So cosmologists study the universe. We try and answer questions like, where did it come from? How did we get here? What's going to happen to it? Big questions. Now, if you think about that, what I've just said is a really big-headed thing to say. What gives us the right to even think, you know, that we can answer questions like that? There's no reason why we should be able to. But it turns out that we, we can. We think we have ideas that explain a lot of this stuff. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. So, the universe, folks. What's out there? Well, I think the best way to imagine what's out in the universe is to imagine that we could take a stone and throw it really hard away from the Earth. We're going to throw this stone so hard that it's not going to come back to Earth. And then let's imagine that we could move with the stone. What would we see? Well, I think we'd see something like this. The stone would whiz away from the Earth, out into the solar system, past the planets, the moon, and so on. Now, I'm terrible with planets because it's not what I do, but I think Mars is in there somewhere and then Jupiter, probably. You, you know more about the, the solar system than I do. So the stone would move through the solar system and eventually it would leave. And we'd start to see dots of light. And we'd realize that those dots of light are stars, just like our sun is a star. And as the stone continued to move, we'd realize that those stars collect together with gas and dust into a huge clump. It's all good scientific language, this, right? A huge clump of stars. It turns out that when we look on the big scale in the universe, stars aren't randomly scattered about. They actually collect together under gravity. It's the force of gravity that pulls stars into these clumps. Now, it's the first time I've used that gravity word today, and I'm going to use it a lot more. Gravity is important. We call these huge clumps, these huge collections of stars, galaxies. Our sun is one star in our galaxy. So does anybody know what our galaxy is called? The Milky Way, quite right. The five pounds is in the post. Our galaxy is called the Milky Way galaxy, and this is why. If you go to parts of the Earth where astronomers tend to work, and that's normally where the sky is very dark, so there's no light pollution. The sky is very clear, there's no air pollution. And that normally means at the top of a mountain somewhere. This picture was taken on top of a mountain in South America, in Chile. Um, inside this building here, this thing's called an observatory, and inside there is a telescope, huge mirror telescope. If you go to those places and you look out at night, you will see this. Shed loads of stars. Another good scientific definition for you. Thousands of stars, stars all over the place. But you will also see this bright band across the sky. Now, in ancient times, people believed there were gods outside the Earth. And they thought that one of their gods had walked across the sky, and as she'd gone, she'd spilt milk. So this was a, a Milky Way across the sky. Now, it's a perfectly valid scientific theory for the time. It explained all the observations. This thing looked like milk, so why not? Well, now we have what we think are a better set of ideas, and we think what we're doing now is we're looking at the stars in our galaxy. But our galaxy is still called the Milky Way. Is our galaxy the only galaxy in the universe? What do you think? No. And in fact, this picture is showing you that. Because if you look on the left-hand side of this picture, you can see these two white splodges. These are galaxies. Now, they're galaxies that are a lot smaller than the Milky Way. They're what we call satellite galaxies. But nevertheless, they're collections of stars, galaxies. So this picture is already showing you that our universe contains at least three galaxies. These two here and our galaxy, the Milky Way. But you know where this is going, right? Our universe is so much more than just three galaxies. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take another imaginary journey. Only this time we're going to take it in a spaceship. Now this journey we'll never make. It's impossibly fast. But nevertheless, 
What you're about to see in this journey is real, really. The images you're about to see were taken with real telescopes, and all the objects you're about to see are in the right positions. So this isn't a PlayStation game, this is scientifically accurate. So, what are we going to do? Well, here's the night sky. We're going to fly, there's the Milky Way, towards this pattern of stars here. Some of you may recognise it, this constellation. There are two stars there, three in a line here, and two stars here. This pattern of stars, this constellation, is called Orion. So we're going to fly towards Orion in our spaceship, and we're going to see what we could see. So let's do it. Let's take the journey. So now we're flying into the night sky. And the first thing we'd realise is that there are smaller collections of gas and dust in the universe. These things. These things are called nebulae. They're very pretty, a lot of them. This one here is called the Orion Nebula because that's where the sword would be in Orion, in the pattern of stars called Orion, so no great surprise there. And this one's called the Horse Head Nebula because some people think that black thing looks like a horse's head. That would be in Orion's belt. But nebulae are very common in the universe and nebulae have affected every one of your lives. But we'll come back to that at the end of the talk. So here's another one, the Rosetta Nebula. And over here is another nebula, the Crab Nebula. Again, we'll come back to the crab at the end of the talk. To give you some idea of how fast we're moving, if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you six and a half thousand years to get to the Crab Nebula. So you can see just how fast this journey is. So now we're still in our galaxy, but we're about to fly out of the galaxy. What we're going to do is we're going to leave the Milky Way and we're going to look back. And you'll see why we call the Milky Way galaxy a spiral galaxy. The stars are sort of arranged like a bit like water going down a plug hole in a bath. And there are those two little satellite galaxies we saw in the picture earlier on. You can see they're a lot smaller than the Milky Way. There are two very big spiral galaxies quite close to our galaxy. This one doesn't have a name, it's just got a number, but this one you may have heard of. This one is called the Andromeda Galaxy. It's a very big, beautiful blue spiral galaxy. It's a lot bigger than ours. So now we've changed scale. Everything you now see in this journey is a galaxy. Now I know some of them look like stars, that's because they're a long way away, but as we get close to them you can see they are indeed galaxies, collections of stars, spirals and so on. It's interesting, or at least it is to some cosmologists, that when you look at the universe on the big scale, even the galaxies aren't arranged randomly. They're not splattered about. There are patterns to the way the galaxies are arranged. It's what we call the large-scale structure of the universe. When we stop our journey, hopefully you'll see what I mean. If you look here, there's a sort of a motorway of galaxies across the universe. There aren't very many here, and there aren't very many down here. One of the big questions is why? Why are the galaxies arranged like this? And we'll come back to that towards the end of the talk too. If you don't take anything else away from today, hopefully you'll take away two things. One, the universe is beautiful. I think it's beautiful. I think that's beautiful, but then again I would say that, wouldn't I? It's what I do. And also, it's big. It is enormous. It's huge. You will never, ever get your head around how big it is. I used to have hair, right, when I started worrying about this sort of thing. So don't go there, especially the ladies in the audience. Don't go there. It's a big place. So this is a problem. The universe is big. I may mention this again. The universe is so big that if you're going to try and study it, you've got problems as a cosmologist. We'll probably never go to the nearest star to the sun to see if that works like our star. And we'll certainly probably never go to the nearest large galaxy to ours to see if it works like the Milky Way. So how are we going to study the universe if we just can't go anywhere? Well, the answer, of course, folks, is we can see it. This stuff. Light is the answer. Astronomers 
can play games with light. Now, okay, it's fairly obvious, I guess. If we couldn't see the universe, then we wouldn't know it was there anyway, so we wouldn't worry. But nevertheless, the universe is shining at us. It's showing us all sorts of things. We can take the light from the universe and find out lots of things. So let's think about light just for a few minutes. More than 300 years ago now, a very famous scientist, a hero of mine, a guy called Isaac Newton, discovered that if he took white light, light from the sun, and he shone it through a glass block, a prism, then the light split up into colours. And Newton said, I can explain this. I think that light is a wave, and different colours of light have different wavelengths. If I shine my white light into the glass block, the different colours, the different wavelengths, are bent by different amounts, and that means the light splits up. We end up with all the colours of the rainbow, from blue light with a short wavelength all the way through to red light with a long wavelength, what we call a continuous spectrum. But there's another kind of spectrum in science that I want to talk about today, and that's a thing called a line spectrum or an emission spectrum. Now these spectra are different. If you take the light from certain things, normally a gas, and you split it up, you don't get all the colours of the rainbow. You only get certain colours. For example, here I've got a couple of greens, a couple of blues, there's a red and so on. You get the idea. Well, so what? Well, it turns out that different gases give different colours. I've got some examples here. For example, hydrogen gas, you've got a very strong red line and a blue and so on. Helium, these colours, argon gives us lots of blue colours here, but neon gas gives us lots of orangey reds. Yes, there are some blue lines too, there are some blue colours and some greens, but these are very faint. Our eyes aren't very good at seeing these colours. So, if you take neon gas and you heat it up, you end up with something like this. A neon sign, folks. You've all seen neon signs before. What we've got here is neon gas, and we're heating it with an electric current, as I've said. The gas is shining, and what you're seeing are mostly the orangey-red colours from this part of the emission spectrum. The blues are there, as I've said, but our eyes just aren't very good. Let's see in those. If you're really smart, you can take the light from this thing and you can split it up. And you can say, there's neon in there. Well, we knew that anyway, right? But you can also say how hot the gas is and what pressure it's under. So that's three things we can find out from this thing just by looking at the light. You've all seen another example of an emission spectrum. If you go out and drive around on the motorway or you walk in certain parts of the city, you're walking around in really strong yellow light. This is the emission spectrum from sodium. If you take sodium metal and you heat it up, it turns into a gas, and then that gas shines in two wavelengths of light that are very close together, really bright yellow colours. And that's what you're seeing here, the emission spectrum from sodium. I'm going to try and show you, live before your very eyes, an emission spectrum all of your own. And for this, you will need your diffraction slides. So, you have to take, now I should say actually, yes, these things are a bit like prisms. They don't work in the same way, but they do split light up into its colours. So it's a sort of a prism, it's a flat prism if you like. What I want you to do is, just like Sarah here, I want you to put this diffraction slide very close to your eye, and then I want you to look at this tube here, this bright source of light. Now, what you've got to do is put the bright tube on the left-hand side of the slide, you know, just like it's shown here. So look at the thing, put that tube on the left-hand side, and you should see some really bright colours. The same size as that sort of lamp there. Can you all see those colours? Now, hopefully you can all see the bright colours. I have a quiz for you guys. I want you to look at the source of light, and then look at these three options here on the screen. First off, can anybody see lots of reds and oranges and greens? Yeah. No, don't say yes. <laughs> Look again, right? Be careful what you're looking at. Can anybody see a red and some greens here? Oh. That's better. What about some purples, a green, and even a yellow line? Yeah. Fantastic. The majority are voting with me on this, right? 
Now, if I was to tell you that those bright colours there, the two purples and the green, are produced typically by mercury vapour, then we'd know there was mercury inside that tube. But also, those yellow lines there, that bright yellow colour, and some of you may be able to see two lines actually very close together, it depends where you're sitting. We know that that yellow colour comes from sodium, just like in the earlier picture. So not only do we know that there's mercury inside this tube, there's also some sodium too. And that's fantastic. Just by taking the light from that tube and looking at it, we can tell what's in there. You've not gone anywhere near this thing, right? Just like astronomers. Astronomers play exactly the same games, but when they do that, they don't get pictures like this, they get pictures like this. Now this is a fantastic picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of a particular region of space. And I can tell you that the blue colours here are hydrogen gas and the white colours in the middle are hydrogen gas under really high temperature and pressure. And that tells astronomers that what we're looking at here is a place where stars are being formed. You're looking at a stellar nursery, the birth of stars. I can also tell you that the green colour here is oxygen, the brown colours are nitrogen and so on. So just by taking the light and splitting it up, we can see what's going on. That's fantastic. But there's something else we can do with light, and it depends upon something you've all heard, literally. The Doppler effect, folks. I'm going to demonstrate here the Doppler effect for sound. Now what I've got here is a buzzer. It's a really annoying buzzer. It emits this really boring note. It's just constant, right? Now, listen what happens to the note when I move this thing relative to you guys. Can you hear the note change? Yeah? Now that's not, that no change is not because I'm doing anything clever with the buzzer. There's nothing up my sleeves. I haven't got any sleeves. But if I stop this thing, the note's the same. The reason you guys can hear this note change is because this source of sound is moving relative to you. The Doppler effect for sound. Now you've all heard this in a far more common situation. If you stand at the side of the road and an ambulance comes towards you, you hear the siren as a high-pitched sound. Then, as the ambulance drives past you, you hear the sound of the siren change note, changes pitch, it goes lower. Now that's not because the pitch of the siren is changing. You guys all know this, right? If I was sat in the ambulance driving along with the siren above me, not moving relative to me, then what I would hear is Woo, woo, woo. Now remember, they pay me to do this. Woo, 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 woo. The note of the siren isn't changing. The siren isn't moving relative to me. So how does the Doppler effect for sound work? Well, I think the best way to picture this is to imagine the siren producing sound waves a bit like ripples on a pond. You know, if you, if you drop a pebble into a pond, it produces circular ripples. Imagine the siren producing circular sound waves. If the siren isn't moving, we're producing waves like this. The gap between these sound waves is the wavelength of the sound. Now look what happens when we start to move the source of sound. When it's stationary, this gap is what you've got to remember, right? That's the wavelength. When we start to move this siren, look what happens to the sound in front. The sound gets squashed. The sound behind gets stretched out. If I'm stood at the side of the road and the ambulance is driving towards me, what I hear is a sound that's been squashed. I hear a sound that's got a shorter wavelength. And to my brain, that sounds like a sound with a higher pitch. As the ambulance drives past me and moves away, I hear a sound that's been stretched. To my brain, that's a, a sound with a longer wavelength. It's a sound with a lower pitch. So that's why the siren changes as the ambulance drives past. Well, what's this got to do with astronomy? Good question. 
It turns out that exactly the same thing happens with light. If we have a source of light that's moving really fast, and by really fast I mean something like oh, 10,000 kilometers a second or more, so you're not going to see this with car headlights. If that thing's moving towards me, I see a set of light wave that's been squashed. I see a light wave with a slightly shorter wavelength. The light looks bluer to my eye. If the source of light is moving away from us, we see a light wave that's been stretched out. The light wave looks slightly redder to our eyes, and that's what this slide is supposed to show you. We can use the Doppler effect for light to figure out if something's moving. If it's moving towards us, or away from us, and even how fast it's moving. And this is how it sort of works. You've got to imagine that we have an object out there that's shining. It's producing an emission spectrum with three colours in it. Now, I'm going to make this thing move away from me at, oh, I don't know, 12,000 kilometres a second. Look what happens to the colours. Now, it's fairly subtle. They're starting out here. If I make this thing move away from me at 12,000 kilometres a second, the colours shift slightly. If I increase the speed at which this thing is moving away from me, look what happens to the colours. If we go to 22,000 kilometres a second, the colours are there. 39, the colours are there. 61, the colours are there. They're shifting. And if I make this thing move away from me at half the speed of light, which is fast, but it's not impossible, then look what happens to the colours. The colours that have started out here have shifted all the way down here to the red part of the spectrum. And that's what astronomers call redshift. You've all heard of redshift, I'm sure. If light from something is redshifted, that means it's moving away from us. But enough about light. Let's get back to the universe for a bit. I told you at the start of this talk that the universe is big. It's huge. I may have mentioned this. It's enormous. I'm going to try and give you some idea of how big. Now, it's not easy, but I'll do my best. If you go out in the wintertime in the United Kingdom and look up at the night sky, you might be lucky enough to see this. Orion again, there's my old friend. If you look down here, you'll see a really boring patch of sky. It's just black. There's nothing in it. You can stand and look at this patch of sky for an hour or two, and you won't see a thing. It's dead boring. And that's why we picked this patch of sky, because it's a really ordinary part of the universe. And we took the Hubble Space Telescope, which is the best telescope we've got, and we pointed it at that really boring patch of sky. And we did that because we wanted to know, if we looked hard enough at really the most boring part of the universe there is, what could we see? Now the first part of this uh, animation, uh, movie is an animation obviously, right? This is the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is what we think it would look like when it's out in space. It always reminds me of a very expensive dustbin, but that's another story. The rest of these images are real. We're now zooming into that really boring patch of sky. And that's what the telescope saw, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at a picture that is so famous it's got its own name. This is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is as far as a species as we've ever seen into the universe. We've never seen further than this. Every dot of light you see in this picture is a galaxy. Now, I know some of them don't really look like galaxies. These two things here, for example, um, they sort of look like stars, really. If you were to ask a youngster to draw you a star, that's the kind of thing they might draw. But in actual fact, they are galaxies. They're just galaxies that are very close to the telescope. They're very close and very bright. They're so bright that the light from them has sort of dazzled the telescope, if you like. It can't hack it. But everything here is a galaxy. There are lots of galaxies that we'd recognise, spiral galaxies like the Milky Way. This picture tells us so much more. Not all galaxies are actually flat disk spirals. Some galaxies are like giant football-shaped collections of stars, these things. Galaxies are different colours, different shapes, and so on. I could talk about this all day. I'm not going to, don't worry. If you look at this image very closely, 
you can see some really faint blue dots. There's one there, there's one over there, and there's one down there. They're galaxies, and the light from those galaxies has taken something like 13,000 million years to get to the Earth. 13,000 million years, that's a long time. It's a fact, right, that um, when we uh, look at the night sky, it's like a time machine. If I look at the moon, I see the moon as it was roughly a second ago, because it takes the light from the moon about a second to get to the Earth. The light from the sun takes about eight minutes to get to the Earth. So we see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. If I was to, uh, somebody was to take away the sun right now, the light that's just set off would still be on its way and it would take eight minutes to get here. The light from those galaxies has taken 13,000 million years to get here. You know, those galaxies are long gone, they're not there anymore. But this is as good as it gets. We've never seen further. If you were to ask a computer how many galaxies there are in that image, it would say, ooh, about 10,000. Well, so what? To give you some idea of how big this patch of sky is, if you imagine taking a grain of sand and putting it on the end of your finger, holding your finger at arm's length, don't imagine it, folks. Go out there and do it. Grain of sand on the end of your finger, hold it at arm's length, and see how much of the night sky that grain of sand blocks out. It's not a lot, right? Imagine how many of those patches you could fit into the night sky. That's how big this picture is. If we look hard enough, there's something like 10,000 galaxies in every grain of sand-shaped patch of sky out there. The universe is big. I may have mentioned this. And it's beautiful. I think this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. But I would say that, wouldn't I? That's what I do. This is a picture taken with the best technology for astronomy that we've got. The gentleman that this telescope's named after, the Hubble Space Telescope, a guy called Edwin Hubble, no great surprise there, took the best technology of his day. And that was a telescope like this one. It was a telescope with a mirror that had a two and a half metre diameter to it, so sort of biggish like that. Hubble realised that with that telescope, for the first time, he could look at the light from distant galaxies. So he thought, let's do it. And he did, and in fact, here's a picture of one of the galaxies he looked at. When Hubble took the light from those distant galaxies and he analysed it, he split it up, the light was red-shifted. Every galaxy he looked at, the light was red-shifted. Remember what that means? That means that these galaxies are all moving away from us. Every galaxy he looked at was rushing away from our galaxy. It's weird. Not only that, Hubble could actually figure out how far away the galaxies were. And he realised that if he picked a galaxy a certain distance from us, it was moving away from us at a certain speed. If he then picked a galaxy that was twice as far away from us as the first galaxy, that was moving away from us at two times the speed of that galaxy. If he picked a galaxy three times as far away, it was moving away from us at three times the speed of the original galaxy. It was like we were at the centre of a giant explosion. Our galaxy is special, right? We're at the centre of something. Everything is moving away from us. That's fantastic. We're special. It's great to be special. Hooray! Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. I've just tried to show you guys that our galaxy is one of many billions of galaxies in the universe. We're not special. So why should it be that everything appears to be moving away from us? Well, the answer, we think, is that it doesn't matter where you are in the universe. It doesn't matter which galaxy you're on. If you look out at the universe around you, it's moving away from you. Nobody's special. The only way we can explain this is if we live in an expanding universe. Our universe is getting bigger. Space-time is getting bigger. This is what Hubble discovered. It was completely unexpected. Even Einstein didn't expect it. 
I've got a simple picture here of um, a universe to try and explain what I'm talking about. My universe here is a simple flat white rubber sheet. And on it, I've got lots of red dots. These are galaxies. It's a very regular universe, this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to expand the universe. And I want you to pick a galaxy in this universe, any galaxy you like. I want you to imagine that you're on that galaxy and you're moving and you're looking out at the universe around you. If you do that, you'll see that the galaxies around you are moving away from you. If you now pick another galaxy and do the same thing, the galaxies around you are moving away from you. It doesn't matter which galaxy you pick in this simple universe. If you look out at the universe around you, it's moving away from you. And that's what Hubble discovered. Our universe is getting bigger. Now this is the only part of this talk I understand. I've been banging on at you for a while now about how big the universe is. But if it's getting bigger, then in the past it must have been smaller, right? If something's bigger today than it was yesterday, then yesterday it's smaller than it is today. Makes sense. If we take that argument and run it backwards in time, our universe at some point must have been really small. Really small. We have a theory to explain this. It's called the Big Bang Theory of the Universe. The Big Bang Theory of the Universe says our universe began really small, really hot, really thick, really dense. It began to expand. It doesn't say why or how. And it's been getting bigger ever since. As the universe has expanded, the heat's got spread out. And eventually, here we are today. That's the Big Bang Theory of the Universe in a nutshell. The Big Bang Theory is a really beautiful theory. But this is the science part. It seems to me as a scientist that theories are only any good if you can test them. Now, not all scientists agree with this, but this is my personal view. A theory is only useful if you can check it. So does the Big Bang Theory make any predictions that we can test? Well, yet it does. It makes loads, actually. But one of the important ones is that when the universe, not long after the Big Bang, was born, not long after the Big Bang, it was just two gases, hydrogen gas, and helium gas. So our universe was two gases. Not only does the Big Bang, say, Big Bang Theory say that, it says the recipe. It tells us that our universe started as three parts hydrogen gas to one part helium. Can we test that? Well, yeah, we can. If you remember, I said to you that when we look out into the night sky, it's like a time machine. If I point my telescope to some part of the universe a long way away, where not a lot has happened, then we get fantastic pictures like this. And if we take the light from that part of the universe and we split it up, we find, sure enough, hydrogen, which is the pink stuff here, and helium, which is the sort of darker stuff here. And not only that, we find hydrogen, which is the dark purple, and helium, the light purple, in roughly three parts to one. Three parts hydrogen to one part helium. This, folks, is a triumph for the Big Bang Theory. It's made a prediction, we've tested it, it's passed, it's fantastic. Would you buy use theory from this man, right? But it's, it's a triumph. Now hang on a minute. The Big Bang Theory says our universe started out as two gases, hydrogen and helium. But when I look out at the universe now, I don't see just hydrogen and helium. Sure, we see it, but we also see stars and we see galaxies. Where did they come from? Well, again, the answer is very simple, really. To make a star is dead easy. All you need is gravity, it's that G word again, and hydrogen gas, and time. And the argument sort of goes like this. You've got to imagine that you're hydrogen gas in the early part of the universe. You're sort of mooching around, minding your own business, you know? Not a lot happening. Occasionally, you might bump into some more hydrogen gas, just by chance. So, you know, there you are mooching along and, oh, hello, hydrogen. How's life? Yeah, well, you know, it's pretty boring. What's it like being hydrogen? Well, not a lot happening, really. Occasionally, some of that hydrogen gas may sort of just hang around together. And when that happens, as you guys all know, we've got a bit more stuff, a bit more mass, and that gives us a bit more gravity. 
Mass has gravity, right? Don't ask me why, nobody knows. This bit more stuff, this bit more gravity, attracts more gas. It pulls down more hydrogen gas. We then get a bit more mass, which gives us a bit more gravity. That pulls on more gas. You get the idea, right? The gas starts to squash down. If you squash a gas, it gets hot. That's a fact. If you don't believe me, the next time you blow a bike tyre up with a pump, feel the pump at the end. It's hot. You've been squashing the gas to get it into the tyre. The gas heats the pump. So, now this gas is squashing down. It's getting hot. The hydrogen atoms are bashing into one another. And the hotter the hydrogen gets, the harder these atoms bash into one another. The atoms get hotter, they bash into one another harder and harder and harder, till eventually they bash together so hard, they stick. If you bash hydrogen atoms together hard enough, they will stick. And that's called nuclear fusion. You end up with some helium gas and a little bit of energy, a little bit of starlight if you like, fusion energy. So now, this gas is collapsing down. Some of the atoms are bashing together so hard, they're fusing. They're producing lots of energy very quickly. This heat energy starts to push back on the gravity force pulling the gas in. As more gas fuses, the two forces balance one another. The heat energy pushing back balances the pull of gravity in, and we end up with a perfect sphere of glowing gas. It's called a star easy. Now I can't show you that for real because it takes a fair amount of time but what I have got here is a computer simulation of this process. Here you can see a big ball of hydrogen gas and the colours are showing you where there's more hydrogen. You can already see there's some slightly brighter colours in the middle here. That's showing us where the hydrogen gas has just started to collapse down. Now I'm gonna let gravity work on the gas. Look what happens. Don't forget, the colours show you where, the, where there's more gas. The gas collapses down under gravity, just like I've explained. More gas, more gravity, etc. The gas gets hotter and hotter, it starts to fuse, and eventually you will see some bright dots of light in this movie. These things are stars. Now this process is a lot more violent excuse me, than I've explained. There's lots of things going on here. For example, you can imagine a big cloud of gas that's rotating. As it collapses down, it starts to spin up faster. Just like if you've seen ice skaters, you know, when they're spinning, they pull their arms in, they spin faster. Well, that's sort of what's going on here. So this is really violent. The stars that are formed, because this gas is all spinning and swirling around, can get thrown away even. And that's what you're sort of seeing here. But eventually, we end up with lots of stars, these bright dots, and some wispy bits of gas left over. Now that's a computer simulation. Can we see this for real in the universe? Well, yes we can. You've already seen one picture, right? Here are some more. Here, the hydrogen gas is orange, and you can see there's some hydrogen gas in the centre here that started to squash down. It started to form stars. This picture here, we've got hydrogen in purple. There's lots of hydrogen gas left here, but there's some bright new young fresh stars. And there's even one star over here that's sort of been thrown away from all these other stars. There's even gas swirling around it, just like in the computer. There's a very famous um, collection of stars, another constellation, a constellation called the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. If you go out at night and look up in the winter, you'll see this little patch of stars in the sky. If we point the Hubble Space Telescope at that patch, we get this picture, fantastic picture. Here, you can see lots of fresh, new, blue, young stars and lots of wispy bits of gas left over. Star formation. So, now we know about stars, right? We take gravity, we take gas, and we take time. I should have said in that computer simulation, that was a quarter of a million years of time. It takes a long time to do this. But the universe has got plenty of time, right? And it's got plenty of gas. It's not a problem. Let's just make some stars. But what about the galaxies? If you remember, at the start, and I'm sure you guys all knew, we said that galaxies are huge collections of stars. Here's a fantastic picture of a galaxy, 
a whirlpool, the way the uh, Sunflower Galaxy. If you also remember at the start, I said, if we look at the galaxies on the large scale in the universe, then they're not randomly scattered about. There's maybe a pattern to the way the galaxies are arranged. Maybe gravity's got something to do with that. When we freeze this, you'll see we have a motorway of galaxies across the universe. There aren't very many up here, and there aren't very many down here. The large-scale structure. And the big question is, or one of the big questions, why? Now, before we start worrying about questions like this in science, we have to be sure that what we're seeing isn't just a figment of our imagination. You know, are these patterns real? To answer that question, astronomers conduct what they call large-scale surveys of the universe. Basically, you point telescopes at loads and loads of galaxies and you measure their positions and you measure their redshifts and all sorts of stuff to see what's going on. Recently, the results of the largest completed survey of galaxies to date was published. And you're about to take a 3D fly through those galaxies. So, you'll need your specs for this, folks. Don't forget, red lens over your left eye. Everybody ready? Right, let's do it. You're looking at our local universe. These galaxies are the real galaxies in their real positions. What we're going to end up with here is what we call a bow tie, and you'll see it in a second when we pull out. You've got to imagine that the Earth is at the centre of this bow tie, if you like. We're on the Earth here, and we're looking out north and south from the Earth. Now, you'll need your 3D glasses again in a few minutes, folks, but for now you don't need them, and the screen is going to get really bright now, so be ready. What we're going to do is we're going to look down on that bow tie. You've got to imagine that we're on the Earth, as I say, in the middle. If we look north or south, this is what we see. The black dots in this image are the positions of all these galaxies, nearly a quarter of a million of them. Now, hopefully, you'll agree with me that there are patterns here. You know? If we look at this structure, the galaxies aren't randomly scattered about. They're on a sort of a, I don't know, like a, a sort of a filamentary pattern, a bit like a dodgy spider's web. In fact, some cosmologists call this the cosmic web. You're looking at the cosmic web. So there are patterns here. The question is, why? Well, to answer that question, we have to go right back to the birth of the universe. If you remember, I said to you, the Big Bang Theory says our universe started out really hot, really dense. It began to expand. It's been getting bigger ever since. As the universe has expanded, the heat's gone down, and here we are today. If the Big Bang Theory is right, even though the universe is really big now, at the past, in the past, it was really, really hot. So even though it's big now, the heat should still be there. It's spread out a lot, but we should still be able to see the heat. It'd be really neat if we could just simply put on a special pair of glasses and look at the night sky. With those special glasses, we'd be able to see the heat left over, the afterglow from the Big Bang. The smoke left over from the fireworks, if you like. Ooh, blimey. Now, unfortunately, I can't put on a special pair of glasses like this. But we can look for this afterglow. Cosmologists have said, right, look, this is the way it is. When the universe was young, it was very hot. There was lots of high-energy light flying around out there. As the universe has expanded and cooled, the energy of that light has got diluted. And now, we haven't got high energy light flying around anymore. We've got energy and light in the microwave region. 
these are, wave, these are waves of light with wavelengths about two centimetres. So these are exactly the same as the microwaves in your ovens at home. That's where the heat's gone. It's what cosmologists call the cosmic microwave background, right? The heat left over from the Big Bang is in the microwave region. If it's there, that's great evidence. What are the properties of the cosmic microwave background? The CMB, the afterglow from the Big Bang. Well, to answer that question, we've launched a whole series of satellites, and the latest and best one was a satellite, this one, the WMAP satellite. It was launched in 2001 by the Americans. And its mission, should it choose to accept it, was to get out there and measure the temperature of our universe more accurately than it's ever been measured before. Could we see the afterglow from the Big Bang? Well, the answer is yes, we can. And this is what the satellite saw. Now, yeah, crikey, what's that, right? The important thing about this picture is that the heat isn't the same everywhere. There are ripples in the CMB. There are hot spots, these red dots, and cold spots, these blue dots. It's not the same everywhere. Now, why is this picture this shape? It turns out that in astronomy, you see a lot of pictures that are sort of this rugby ball shape. Why is it like that? Well, you've got to imagine that we're on the Earth, looking out from the Earth in our galaxy. We're going to zoom in to the Earth. Hopefully we'll find it, otherwise I'm talking to an illusion here. Oh, there we are. Good, I'm not going crazy. Now imagine the Earth is inside a football. The universe is the inside of that football. If we look away from the Earth, we see it. Then we're going to take that football, we're going to cut it open, and we're going to fold it flat onto a piece of paper. If I do that, I get this rugby ball shape, and then I'm going to go from the visible part of the spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, all the way down to the microwave part, and then I'm going to crank the contrast all the way up. If we do that with the WMAP satellite, we get this picture, well, sort of almost. What we've got in this picture is a big red band across the middle. That's actually the heat from our galaxy, because our galaxy is slightly warmer than the rest of the universe. But we can take that away, because we understand that, we can subtract it, right? And when we do that, we end up with that picture we saw earlier on, the afterglow from the Big Bang. This, folks, is probably the most important picture in the history of cosmology. This picture was actually published in March this year, so this is up-to-date stuff. As I say, this is the most important picture in the history of cosmology, in my opinion, and smarter people than me. This is so important to cosmologists, it's so loved by cosmologists that we've put it onto a beach ball. We love this thing, right? I can take this on my holidays with me, the heat left over from the Big Bang, and I can go to the beach and I can play with this fantastic thing. Hey, look, it's a life, right? It's the only one I've got, so don't knock it too much. But the message is, this is important. This is important. Not only that, but you can actually tune into the birth of the universe too. If you've got a TV set at home, an old thing, I hope you haven't got one like this, but nevertheless, if you have, if you switch it on when it's not tuned into anything, you'll hear this. A horrible noise. But you'll also see lots of dots on the screen. It's a fact, folks, that roughly one in ten of these dots is caused by the heat left over from the Big Bang, the CMB, getting inside your television set. So don't ever tell me there's nothing worth watching on the telly. All you've got to do is switch it on, tune it out, and tune in to the birth of the universe. Ah, think on. So where was I? Oh yeah. Where did the pattern of galaxies come from? I told you the answer lies in this fantastic picture. What you've got to do is imagine the hot spots and cold spots are like hills and valleys in the early universe. The blue spots are the valleys and the red spots are the hills. If you're gas in the early universe, you're going to roll down the hills into the valley bottoms. You're going to collect where the blue dots are in that picture. Okay. Now we let gravity act on the universe. As the universe expands, gravity acts to magnify these ripples of gas. Just like we were making stars, only on a bigger scale. The gravity pulls the gas down into clumps. 
and this simulation shows you that happening, this thing here, my galaxy, is to remind me, to remind you guys, that what we're looking at here aren't stars anymore, it's the same sort of process, but these dots here, in fact, are galaxies. And hopefully, you'll agree with me that the galaxies are on a sort of like a filamentary pattern, like a web. In Durham, and this is the blatant plug for Durham, folks, what we do is we build the universe on a computer. I work with people in the Institute for Computational Cosmology. Try saying that. It's a hell of a mouthful. What we do is we build the universe using really powerful supercomputers like this one. What we say to the computer is, here's the W map picture. That's where you've got to start. Here's some gas. Here's some gravity. Go away and make me a universe. Go figure. Last year, we published the results of the largest computer simulation that's ever been performed, the Millennium Simulation. And you're about to take a 3D fly through it. So you'll need your glasses again, folks. Everybody ready? Right, let's do it. So now we're flying through our universe, a computer simulation, a computer picture. We're actually flying home. In this part of our simulation, we're flying towards the Milky Way galaxy. There it is. So we are flying home, as I say. Hopefully, you'll agree with me, that when we look at the patterns of galaxies in this simulation, and the galaxies, again, are where the bright dots are, you can see that they're arranged on like a filamentary pattern, on like a web. It's a fact that when we compare the results of our computer simulation with the results of those measurements you flew through earlier on, if we use the WMAP picture as a starting point, they match almost perfectly. We now, we think, have a very good understanding of how the universe came to be by using a computer. To give you some idea of how big this simulation is, if you were to run this simulation on a PC at home, it would take your PC about 39 years to run the code. So this is a, we need a big computer for this. Even then it took us a month. So now we have a good model for the universe, we think. And with that model, we can answer one of the big questions in cosmology. The universe. What next? What's going to happen to the universe. Because we can take our computer model and we can run it forward to today, where we know we're pretty good, and then we can run the model on. What's going to happen? If you think about this, there are sort of three options. The first option is our universe will just keep expanding forever. And that's what this is supposed to show you here. The second option is our universe will expand for a while, it will gradually slow down, and then maybe it will just stop. And that's what the image in the bottom left is supposed to show you. The third option is our universe will expand for a while, it'll slow down, it'll stop, but then it'll come back together again in what we call a big crunch. We've had a big bang, is our universe going to end in a big crunch? And that's what the panel at the top there is supposed to show you on the left. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Our computer simulation tells us that our universe is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's the fate of our universe, if we're right. So I'm almost through. We've talked about gravity and gas, and I've explained, hopefully, to you guys how we can make a universe with gravity and gas. It's very easy. But there's only one thing missing here. When I look out at you guys in the audience, you're not made of hydrogen and helium. You're made of calcium and carbon and oxygen, nitrogen, iron, loads of heavy elements. Where did they come from? Well, the answer lies back with stars. If you remember, we said that stars are big balls of hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas is just fusing to produce helium and starlight. A star will fuse hydrogen gas for billions of years. Our sun, we think, has enough gas to burn for about 10 billion years, 10,000 million years. It's about halfway through, so don't worry too much. 
But even a star that's a lot bigger than the sun will eventually run out of gas. You know, it's only got so much hydrogen, it's going to run out. When a star, a massive star, runs out of hydrogen, then <laughs> it explodes. We have a huge explosion. These things are the biggest bangs since the big one. Huge explosions. I can show you a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here we have a galaxy. Now, you can't see the stars on the outer edge of this galaxy because they're obscured by dust. They are there, it's just the dust is blocking out the light from the stars. But you can see the stars in the middle. There are millions of stars, just like the sun, minding their own business, fusing their gas. If you look down here, there's a really bright object. This is one star that's gone supernova. It ran out of gas and exploded. For a short amount of time, that star was as bright as all the millions of stars in the centre of this galaxy. This is a big explosion. Powerful. If you remember, at the start of this talk, we flew past the Crab Nebula, and I said we'd come back to the Crab at the end. I can tell you that the Crab Nebula is what's left from when a star exploded 952 years ago. I could even tell you the date if I could remember it. How do I know that? Well, it turns out that the Chinese have been doing astronomy for thousands of years. And 952 years ago, a Chinese astronomer came out of his house and he looked up and then he ran back into his house again and he wrote this. Now, my Cantonese is very bad, so luckily I have a translation and it says, a guest star appeared at dawn in the east. During daylight it appeared like Venus, with horned rays radiating in all directions. It had a reddish white colour and it lasted for a total of 23 days. When this star exploded it was so bright that you could look outside, look up at the sky and see it during daytime. Now remember what I said about the crab. I said to you, if you could travel at the speed of light it would take you six and a half thousand years to get there. That's how powerful this explosion was. We think if you went out at night and looked up at the sky you would see this. This star was so bright it would be like there was a new full moon in the sky. You know, that's how powerful this explosion is. What's really neat, I think, about supernovae is what's left. After the explosion's finished and things have calmed down, you're left with what we call a supernova remnant. The Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant. It's what's left over after that star exploded. It's the sort of the coal, the, the, the glowing embers, if you like, of the explosion. This picture was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of the Crab Nebula, a fantastic picture. I've got loads of these things, right? These things are beautiful. Here's a, another example of one. And here's probably my favourite example, this thing. This is called Cass A, a supernova remnant. Beautiful thing, it is beautiful. If we take the light from these things and we split them up, split it up, we find atoms of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, calcium. All the heavy elements that formed in your bodies were made in supernova explosions like these. I don't want to get like really heavy with you or anything, but you guys are all children of the universe. You're all made of stardust. Fantastic. So I really am through now. The title of this talk is Gravity, Gas and Stardust. We've talked about gravity, we've talked about gas and how those two things can make stars and galaxies, and I'm talking to the stardust. So, thanks very much for listening. But before I go, just one more thing. I don't want you guys to think that we know everything. We know nothing. I've told you a story today about the 5% of the universe that's shiny, the stuff that we can see. It's a fact that we're very ignorant about lots of things. 
Here are some big questions that we need help with. People like me have run out of ideas now. We need fresh young minds like yours to come help us find the answers to these questions, you know? If any of you guys are switched on by science, then keep studying it. Come and help us. Come and tell me the answer to these questions. For example, most of the stuff in the universe is missing, like I've just said. Nine-tenths of our universe we can't see. We don't know what it is. We know it's out there because we can feel it. But we don't know what it's made of. We call it dark matter, right? Ooh. But that just proves how ignorant we are. Help. Another big question that's suddenly come around in cosmology in the last five years, really, is why has the universe changed gear? I told you that the Big Bang says our universe is going to keep uh, expanding forever now, but we thought the universe would gradually be slowing down. In actual fact, we've discovered the universe is speeding up. It's changed gear. We don't know why. We've put that down to a thing called dark energy. Ooh, even scarier. We don't know what it is. Help. And finally, if any of you guys are into particle physics, then maybe you'd like to help answer the question, what happened in the first second after the Big Bang? Because we really don't know so much about that. Help. Right. Gravity, gas and stardust, folks. I'm looking at the stardust. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So the question is, folks, the Big Bang Theory is rubbish, it's been scrapped, right? And is there another theory? Well, um, you might read things in the popular press that say the Big Bang Theory is nonsense. Um, I told you that there are lots of predictions that the Big Bang Theory makes, like the mix of gases, the, 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 the heat left over. There are loads more predictions that it makes too. And as far as I know, and I could be wrong, but as far as I know, it's passed all the tests so far. So the Big Bang Theory is a great theory. However, what it doesn't tell us is why, you know? If you remember at the start I said to you the Big Bang Theory says this, this, this and this. It doesn't say how or why. So it's not a complete theory by any stretch of the imagination. Some cosmologists are trying to get more complete theories if you like. Theories that may explain why and how. But the Big Bang Theory is not, it's not in trouble, trust me, as far as I know anyway. Um, it's, it's okay, it's sound, I think. Yeah, I'd like to know where God fits into your theory. Okay, the question is, so where does God fit into my theory? And I've just answered your question. I said to you, the Big Bang Theory says, it doesn't say, it says the universe began to expand and so on, it doesn't say how or why. If you have a faith, then that's where God comes in, as far as I'm concerned. That's where she makes the universe work, right? Um, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to disprove, I'm not trying to disprove anything here. Sir, gentlemen. Um, in the angels and demons, where down ground, they have, like, antimatter, is that such a thing? Okay, so the question is, in a popular book whose author I'm not going to mention the name of, um, <laughs> is there such a thing as antimatter? Well, yes, there is, yeah, is the quick answer. Um, it's, it's a strange one, and this is one of the questions, actually, that we haven't answered, because it says there, what happened in the first second after the Big Bang? When we do particle physics experiments, and Peter here can tell you more about that than I could, when we, when we create matter in, in particle accelerators, we create ordinary matter, the stuff that we're made of, and antimatter. And whenever we do that, we make it in equal amounts. So always equal parts, anti and ordinary. So when the universe was born, why didn't the Big Bang make equal amounts of matter and antimatter? Because when we look out into the universe now, we don't see lots of antimatter. You know, we don't think we do anyway. We've never found any. So that's one of the mysteries. That's one of those questions at the end there. So, you know, help. But antimatter does exist, yes. It's, we can make it every day at CERN and places like that. Any more? Yeah, question over there. Why, why are the new galaxies forming in the low energy um, areas in the <laughs> Why are the new galaxies forming in the... Oh, you mean, you mean the, the hills and valleys thing? <laughs> um, that's a good question. It turns out that the, the, the heat map 
The blue spots, like I said to you, are, are, are cold spots. Um, if you imagine the light traveling through the early universe, and this is going to get complicated, right? So bear with me on this one. Um, I know you're a six-former, so we can go a bit with this. Um, as the light travels around gravitational holes, if you like, wells, bits where gravity are, the light sort of tends to lose a bit of energy as it, it tries to climb away from these gravitational wells. So if you imagine that being translated into the temperature map, the light that's gone near these dips has lost more energy, so it's slightly colder in, in cold and hot, if you know what I mean. It's a, you can't really use cold and hot with light, you know it can't, but you know what I mean. So that's why the blue spots are where the mass has started to, to form already, because that's where the gravity is already. And that's why the blue dots show that because the light has lost, a, the, the microwaves have lost a bit more energy as they've gone round those parts of the universe to start with. So it gets a bit complicated and to be honest, when I first put this together, I walked into the staff room at work and said to five cosmologists, so does the, the stuff start forming in the blue bits or the red bits? And two hours later, we really hadn't come up with a proper definite answer to it. We think it's the blue bits though, but there's, there's lots of effects going on which make the pattern a bit confused. But on average, it's the blue stuff, right? Honest. Trust me on that one. At least I think it is. <laughs> any more for any more? Yeah. Young. Are there multiple universes? Wow. wow. Are there multiple universes? That's a good question. So, is our universe the only universe? Okay, so that's a good question too. And it turns out that modern cosmology theories, some cosmologists who are smarter than me, are now saying that, well, actually, our universe might not be the only universe. There might be many universes. You can think of this as sort of like um, uh, washing up bubbles on a, on a washing up bowl. If you're doing the pots, you know, all the bubbles. Imagine each one of those bubbles could actually expand into another universe. So that's what we call multiverse theory. I don't know the answer, but I'm just stalling here, right? Um, so it's possible. Some cosmologists believe that there's more than one universe out there. But whether we'll ever know for definite, I don't know. But yeah, it's a good one. Young lady. Is there other universes? Yeah. Here we go. What, what does that mean for us now? It is kind of the okay, yeah, it's a good, that's a great question, right? So, so, um, hey, no, that's a, that's a great question. The question is, if there is more than one universe, can we move next door? You know, if the house prices go up too much, can we move to another universe? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think so. I don't think so. Young man. Uh, what do black holes kind of do? Wow, black holes. Black holes, right? Do they exist? Black holes are actually, we didn't talk about it in the talk, but when I said to you that these big massive stars, they go supernova and they explode, and they produce lots of heavy elements that you're all made of. But some stars can actually, when they die like that, produce black holes. And the way it works is sort of, the stuff in the middle of the star, when they have this huge explosion, and I may have mentioned they're pretty big, right? Huge explosion. The stuff in the middle gets squashed down so tight, so hard, that the gravity is so intense in that really small part of space that the gravity just swallows the star up, swallows the bit up that's left. So you get so much gravity that space sort of swallows itself, if you like. And that's what we call a black hole. Black holes, the gravity from those things is so strong that even light can't get out. You know, I said to you at the start of the talk, imagine we could take a stone and throw it away from the Earth. If we throw a stone hard enough, it'll go. That's how we launch rockets, right? You know, we throw a rocket fast enough away from the Earth, it escapes Earth's gravity. Black holes have got so much gravity that even light, which is the fastest thing we know of in the universe, even that's not fast enough to get away from the gravity of the black hole, so it swallows the light. Weird. So that's what a black hole is, we think, and that's how they're made, sort of. So, you know, that's... But they, they are real. We, we see evidence for them all over the place. Thank and that... <laughs> Thanks for listening, folks. Thank you.